Welcome to Landmark Chambers and Town Legal's webinar, all you ever wanted to know about zoning but were afraid to ask. We're really delighted to see so many of you jo uh, joining the session uh, today and hope that you'll find the discussion useful and also uh, informative. Uh, my name's Simon Ricketts, I'm a partner at Town Legal and will chair the session today. I'm surrounded on the screen by uh, a formidable panel uh, and panellists, I'll ask you individually to say hello or wave by way of introduction. So uh, I'm joined by Jonathan QC from Lamar Chambers, <laughs> uh, who has a Hong Kong as well as UK practice. And uh, so he comes with hands on experience of um, working within uh, another um, planning system which has adopted zoning. Uh, we've got Charlie Banner QC, also from Landmark Chambers. Uh, welcome, Charlie. A wide-ranging planning and public law practice, uh, also with Hong Kong experience. And now, of course, planning TV chat show host via We Have We Got News, uh, planning news for you. We've got uh, my colleagues, first of all, uh, Steve Quartermain, CBE, uh, previously, of course, the government's former chief planner and um, my partner at Town Legal, uh, Duncan Field. Duncan has previously written on zoning and in particular what we might or might not learn from um, parts of the Australian system in relation to zoning and contrasting that to permission in principle. <laughs> Lastly, uh, our two very special guests, both of whom, if you believe the newspapers at least, have been directly linked to the government's current thinking on planning reform in this area, but I should emphasize that they're speaking in an entirely personal capacity and not here to comment on those media pieces. First, the only person to my knowledge who has ever led a report on planning reform that has immediately led to significantly positive and sensible changes are Bridget Rosewell. Hello Bridget. And last but not least, uh, I don't use this word lightly, but the legendary uh, Sir Stuart Lipton who throughout his career has been responsible for a series of transformational development projects and continues to be one of the country's leading thinkers and doers, and that's a rare combination. To begin with, a few uh, housekeeping points. First of all, your microphones are automatically muted, so you won't need to adjust your local settings. Secondly, we very much welcome questions during uh, your uh, uh, during the session. Please submit them via text in the Q&A section, which may be found at the top or bottom of your uh, screen. Uh, thirdly, we'll endeavour to answer as many questions as possible during this event. We may come back to you after the event with answers to which we didn't have time for, but it depends how many we receive. There are a lot of you out there. I should say we may run slightly past um, six six o'clock if the discussion takes us that way. Um, um, there is a lot to cover. This webinar will be recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording shortly after the event concludes. If your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, we'll invite you to rejoin the uh, uh, meeting by clicking on the original link once more. So we've got a lot to get through and this isn't a traditional seminar. In a moment, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to speak for a few minutes on an aspect of the topic with some follow-up comments by others, and then for us directly to address some of the Q&A. For a summary of what I take to be the background to the government's current consideration of the potential for significant reform of our planning system, including particularly the potential role for zoning, you might want to read uh, my Simonicity blog post last weekend, which referred to the January 2020 policy exchange report by Jack Airy. Jack Airy, now of course, number 10, uh, planning and housing special advisor, and Robert Jenrick's planning for the future document in March, which set out some general themes for inclusion uh, in a planning white paper later in the year. But uh, no, so let's begin, first of all, with Bridget, and, and Bridget, I really wanted to ask you, you know, what, what do you mean by zoning and, and you know, why is this a relevant issue to raise now? Okay, so I think that the, I want to start by just a little bit of what I see the context to all of this being, why we're talking about 
zoning and what we might mean by that, I'll come back to. Um, because I want to start by, by just sort of setting a little bit of a what I view is that I, I can't find anybody who thinks the system we've got works. So that's kind of point one, if you like, that here is a system which has become horrendously complicated, very uh, unwieldy, expensive, uncertain, certainly lacks transparency. If you're an ordinary punter, how does this work? Uh, are you able to understand it? No, you're not. And, and we've tried to solve every individual problem with our existing system by just adding another, add another bolt on. Um, so I think that the idea that we need to do something about this is, is actually, you know, I think that that's one of the, the building blocks for thinking about, well, would zoning and what do we mean by zoning as a different way of approaching it? Because, of course, the fact that um, everybody thinks there's something wrong with it doesn't mean to say that everybody agrees with what is wrong with it, nor indeed that there are, aren't, for any change, there would be winners and indeed losers. So how do we generate the right kind of debate on what to replace it? Because one thing that I'm particularly keen on is unless we have that debate, um, then uh, any change that you make can A, be subverted, um, learned that doing uh, projects and programs over, over my career, but equally it won't gain acceptance and therefore it will be under continuous challenge. So I think that there's real need here to kind of open up that debate. So I'm really pleased, that's why I've agreed to do this. So I'm really pleased to be here and, and am amazed at how many people have actually signed up to talk about this. So what do we mean if we want to say something? Um, so, so the kind of thing that I think we need to aim at is something that could be more efficient, more transparent, and, and, and also therefore more acceptable. So those are my kind of three, three ways in which I think we could think about this. Uh, and anybody who's got any ideas in that, I don't, I'm, I'm certainly not the sole guardian of truth on anything, um, but those are the sorts of principles that I would like to see us do. Does a zoning approach help in that regard? Well, I don't think it will if we can't agree what we mean by zone and we can't agree what is covered, uh, what the criteria are. And I think there's an awful, I think there's a, a lot of different ways in which people use it, although there's definitely a thread, which is a zone is a set of rules. So I might come back to this question of rules right at the end. Because one way you could think about it is a very, very general zones, zones where you could say in this particular area, zone, geography, anything goes. You could do whatever you feel like it. This is a development zone. Equally, there could be areas where nothing could, go, uh, could happen. You know, AONBs, triple SIs, or all of those sorts of things could be zones for nothing to happen. So that's one that's sort of the mo I guess, an extreme version, a zone for nothing, a zone for anything. But it's probably not what most people think because most people want to have something which is a much more codified, zones as a code. So there we have use classes, obviously use classes are themselves a code of, some, of one kind of a code, but most people might, when they talk about a zone, talk about a different kind of a code, a code which says, this is a city center. And in a city center, these are the kind of things that you can do. These are the densities, these are the heights, these are the, uh, the designs possibly. And again, we can actually come back um, and have further discussion about at what level that those decisions might be made. Um, you could have a suburban code, you could have a village code, different ways of thinking about the, um, the, the rules that you set around any particular set of, any particular designation. And that's rather different and could cut across use classes. So I think there's something that we need to think about there because otherwise you end up with things which are going to be, get, make life even more complicated. Mm. And if I'm aiming for efficiency trans and transparency in particular, making it more complicated is certainly not a way to go. So that there's a, there's a kind of an aspect to that. So I, I the idea of a zone as something which is a rule that automatically gets you planning permission. If you've ticked the particular boxes for those codes, you've automatically got <laughs> planning permission of some form which wouldn't require any other form of assessment. So that's another consequence. If a zone is a code, you've met the code, 
you can then have your planning permission. Mm. But then there is a question of at what level those codes are being defined and indeed whether zones are apply to sites. Are we still in a site allocation world or are we trying to think about areas which are bigger than that? So I think the distinctiveness of all the ways of thinking about a zone is that there, there are clearer set of rules on what is permitted and uh, which should simplify the process at least of how you get that planning permission if you meet those rules. The final thing, however, sorry, John, Simon, did you? Oh, you, you, uh, I was going to ask and do come on to it l later, Bridget, but I was, I was going to ask how, how you feel, you know, the, lo the, the local plan fits, fit, fits, fit, fits into, into this. And, you know, I, I've, I've, I've read you. Well, that's in, what I was about to come on to. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, so if these are our different kinds of zones and we can talk, we can, uh, we can think about what sort of zone we might learn, what kind of zoning we might want to think about then the question is <coughs> setting these codes at what level and how does it interact with whatever is uh, with a local planning authority there are some people who think one of the ways of using zoning is to change the definitions of a local planning authority to make them bigger that's something that that one could discuss um, then and, and there are pros and cons obviously that there's some people who've said we should do this at the level of historic counties and then cities some people who say the local planning authority is the local planning authority. We're used to that. You know, don't change the things that you don't really need to change. And indeed, you can, you can undermine the effectiveness of a system by trying to change too much and everybody gets confused. And people like um, Charlie and John and co can go at it from a legal point of view and challenge this because it's not clear. So the more you can build on a system, so maybe the LPA is, is the best route to that. And then the LPA would be the entity which would define what these zones were and possibly define the codes or possibly you might say that you want those codes defined at a much higher level. At a national level, there would be city equals this, suburban equals that. But the local planning authority would be setting a plan which would allocate uh, different um, areas, different parts you get very, very strung up here on trying to get some terminology which doesn't confuse, um, could allocate different parts of its area, um, planning area, in a plan, to those different typologies, yeah. which would then be the, the zoning codes. And having done so, anybody who comes along and says, I want to put suburban, some suburban developments in this, and this is the, I'm meeting the code, then, you know, it's a, it's a much quicker and more, um, um, and a more streamlined process than the one that we would have at the moment where everything has to be much more dealt with on a case by case. So there are lots of further discussion and decisions that I think we all need to make around what that level of geography is, how defined we want those zones to be, how many, uh, how it cuts across use classes or doesn't cut across use classes, We've got a lot of those already. Do we? Uh, there are too many of those. So I think there's a lot of debate that we still need to have. But I come back to what my priority is, which is to produce something which is simpler, more transparent, more efficient, which people can understand. Ordinary people, people out there, can understand and be engaged with. Um, and what we mustn't do is try and produce something which is so clever that it actually is it's uh, it tries to deal with so many things that it is just as complicated as the thing we've got at the moment because that would spend we'd spend an awful lot of time and energy and actually not get anywhere so that's my plea how do we make this thing more better simpler more transparent and thereby also make it more efficient i'll stop there <laughs> No, no, that, that's fascinating, Bridget. I mean, we've had lots of questions already, which is great. And I'm just trying to pick up some of the themes of um, um, the, the, the questions. And one thing that comes through uh, loud and clear is, um, you know, are, are we clear about the problems that we're looking to solve? And don't we have the tools already in terms of, uh, you know, one of the questioners has pointed out, you know, when you look at uh, area action plans, master plans, site allocation documents, SPDs, um, you know, don't, don't we have the tools? No, because we've got too many of them. 
Right. I mean, isn't that you just produce this huge list that you could do this, you could have a local development yeah. order, you could go to a DCO, you could go, we, we could argue, we can discuss uh, development corporations slightly separately. We've got such a complicated system that there are many, many things you can do, but choosing it, getting it agreed, having, having something that people, whether they want to engage in development or whether indeed they want to oppose development, getting anything that anybody understands except experts like ourselves well i'm not sure that i am an expert actually because i keep finding bits that i don't that i don't understand it's so complicated well thanks Bridget. that's a, that's a great introduction to 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 the 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 subject and so to turn to duncan now um you know so how how might uh, we move towards a, a, a system that might be said to be a zoning based system whilst not making everything just ridiculously complicated. How, how do you see it? Well, so I think it's a huge challenge, really. I mean, to take two extremes. I mean, first of all, to take Bridget's point, you have to know what you're aiming for because, you know, the two uh, different extremes have two different legislative consequences. If we went to a full-on zoning system, a bit like the States or uh, Australia, then you're looking at a new... Uh, act of parliament to legislate for the framework that will set up uh, the zoning system with that an array of regulations and ministerial directions which would set out you know the form of planning or zoning schemes um, the procedure that needed to be followed um, and their con and probably some standardized content uh, you'd then be looking for each administrative area to put in place planning or zoning schemes which would identify zones for development uh, and within those zones rules on the uses that would be acceptable or the built form that would be acceptable. Um, you'd probably have to make provision for rezoning um, and for variance from the zone but potentially although that isn't the case in every zoning system and still alongside this you would need policy so at least probably a national policy framework and a local policy framework or strategic statement of some some sort uh, and so you can readily see how you know if we went for a full-on zoning system that risk of complexity that Bridget alluded to could quite easily arise and we do have a propensity I think in this country to you know legislate um, to, 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 to the book and to um, gold plate regulation so um, you know we, we must be careful about that on, on the other extreme you know, if, if we were to make use of the tools that we already have, you know, we do have tools that are there now, which could be described as zoning tools, uh, simplified planning zones and enterprise zone schemes. You know, they were very common in the 1980s um, and, and could be used again. We've had local development orders for about 15 years, which actually are pretty much underutilized, but allow a local authority to grant planning permission over a geographic area for specified uses and last but by no means least we've got a path partially implemented permission in principle concept and the bit that hasn't been implemented is the bit which allows you to allocate land in a development plan for permission in principle um, uh, you know and that seems to me to be an easy way to slot in a, a zoning system within our current local plan system but um, yeah as I say what you, choose, what you choose dictates the legislative outcome. And, and if we're going to make use of what we have, then probably the only primary legislation we would need to change is perhaps the restriction, the restriction. mentioned in principle, which um, uh, restricts you to have led to that. Yeah. Uh, other than that, it's regulatory changes to list some of the limitations on those three tools that we already have. Okay, so, so what do you see as the main practical issues uh, you know, if we're trying to use the tools that we've got uh, and someone asked a question could a zoning system emerge in parallel to our existing system yes I mean I think I think actually whichever route you choose you chose you would have to allow zoning to emerge in parallel with the existing system for a period of time if we were to use the existing tools we have you know the main challenges are probably the limitations that I alluded to a moment ago, which is around, you know, the extent to which each of those three concepts can allow EIA development or development that adversely impacts on uh, European habitats, for example. 
Um, there's probably a huge resourcing issue for local authorities because particularly if we're using the existing tools, they've already got to deal with planning applications and local plans. We're now asking them to make greater use of other tools. And whilst that should reduce the workload in time, for the first two or three years, it wouldn't do. And you might have to develop some form of concept where you know a developer promotes an LDO or an enterprise zone in, in partnership with a local authority and funds uh, or, or, or a group of landowners fund the process for the local authority, you know, they'll be a, a little risk averse partly because of the resource, but also the risk of legal challenge around, you know, we'd be talking at, at the EIA, I think, if we were using any of those three tools, not, not strategic environmental assessment, plus habitats assessment and so on. Um, so, you know, on the subject of local development orders, I mean, what, what would you see as good examples of use of LDOs under the current system? I mean, I think there's, there's a good resource. There aren't that many of them, so it doesn't take long to look through them. There's a good resource on the Local Government Association website, which allows you geographically to hover over different regions that have LDOs in place. Mm -hmm. uh, one that I've come across, which is, I think, pretty effective, is the London Gateway Logistics Park Local Development Order, which you know grants permission for a range of uh, warehousing and industrial uses across that logistics park, includes things like design codes, management plans, um, codes of construction practice, a set of conditions for each um, uh, development that comes forward, and a, and a sort of procedural route for prior notification, which uh, you know with which is accompanied a fee and a standardised section 106 agreement. So um, you know there are certainly good examples out there. Yeah, and at the other extreme, you know, final question before we move on. I mean, if we did move to your first, either your, 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 your first thought about, well, if we went to a completely new system of zoning, uh, you know, where in the world do we look for examples of that? You know, what, what are the good examples? Yeah, we're spoiled for choice, really, I guess. <laughs> it depends what you want. You know, we, we could go, I know others will talk of different areas of the world, but we could go for a US style system, you know, based it on New York, which is the zoning map behind me, actually. Um, but that's a very prescriptive system, um, very detailed, codified set of rules. You certainly know what you can do, but there's very limited opportunity for variance. There are such things as zoning variance permits and the opportunity to, do, to undertake rezoning, but they're the exception rather than the rule. Or you could go for something probably a bit more familiar to us, simply because of the uh, two layers of planning policy and the uh, state and local level division, which would be, you know, something like the state of Victoria in Australia, which which I looked into when I I wrote that piece that you referred to at the beginning, Simon. Um, you know that that still allows you to entertain the possibility of permits. You know, you you have rules. You don't have to switch the permitting procedure on, but most in most zones there will be still a requirement for permits for different types of, of aspects of the development yeah okay that's really interesting so so charlie um you know the legal challenges to all of this i suppose in both senses of the word you know thank you simon um, you make of it uh, well, I, th I think the, there are four aspects of the legal and associated challenges facing most if not all forms of uh, zoning regime in the UK. And I should say at the outset that um, I'm by no means an entrenched opponent of zoning, simply that these are points that have to be fully worked through under any new system. And I must say also I've got a lot of fondness for policy exchange having been its very first intern back in 2002. So here are my four points. Um, firstly, legal challenges to zoning plans themselves. Um, now under any form of zoning, the plan is intended to be to a greater or lesser extent more definitive in the sense that the zoning plan leaves either less or no scope for subsequent discretion and debate at the project stage and therefore more certainty and i think there are three consequences from this firstly parties affected by a plan will have an even greater than now litigation incentive to challenge a plan they don't like because there'll either be no or a significantly reduced opportunity for arguing at the project specific stage that the plan should be departed from challenging the plan may be the last roll of the dice for them 
Secondly, the plan making process has got to be made more manageable. Already in relation to existing local plans, which are less definitive, the process is far too protracted and many local plans need radical surgery examination in order that they're not out of date before they're even adopted. And that surgery sometimes creates its own legal problems. So we need to streamline the process. But if it's streamlined too much, then there will be individual and or systemic challenges to the fairness or other legality of the new uh, approach. So a fine balancing exercise is required. And one idea might be to condense the various iterative stages of the current local plan consultation and examination process into a single consolidated local zoning plan inquiry. And the third consequence is what happens when plans, zoning plans are past their sell by date? If there's no discretion to depart from the plan at the project stage, then there's no ability to limit the weight to be given to an out of date plan. And what incentive do authorities have then to keep their plan up to date? Maybe the answer is a sunset clause built into the plan so that it's automatically self terminating on a set date. My point number two, um, legal challenges to project specific decisions. Now, currently, as we all know, the approach of the courts is not to interfere with evaluative planning judgments, respecting the discretion afforded to the decision maker. Planning, the Court of Appeal has recently told us, an algorithm, but a multi layered exercise of evaluative discretion. Well, Zoning means taking away judgment and discretion to a greater or lesser degree at the project stage. The whole point of zoning is that it is algorithmic and that must in turn surely mean that decision makers will be much less able to hide behind planning judgment when faced with a judicial review. And so I think that Jack Airy's assumption in his policy exchange paper that zoning would mean a reduction in legal challenges is by no means a given. It may even lead to an increase. Point number three, um, env environmental and heritage challenges. Now, let's assume we're going to keep some kind of environmental assessment regime in the long term post Brexit, uh, and the list of buildings and conservation areas regulation is here to stay too. Now, if so, how is that gonna work? Uh, the zoning plan won't be, I think, sufficiently granular to allow a meaningful assessment of a future project's heritage environmental effects. Um, if we say zoning doesn't apply to EI development, then it's not really gonna achieve very much. Uh, in Hong Kong, there's a separate post-planning requirement for an environmental permit, a separate regime, a bit like the building regs currently is here. Now, is that the answer or would it simply reintroduce much of the red tape that zoning is intended to remove? Well, John's going to pick up on that when he deals with the lessons from Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, point number four, the UK conundrum, and to, to continue the Hong Kong theme, will we be one country, two systems? Um, planning is a devolved matter, so presumably the reforms, if they happen, will be England only. Uh, and three immediate points arise from this. Firstly, uh, will introducing radically divergent approaches to planning within the UK be attractive to investors looking to set up in multiple parts of the UK? Are they going to think this is more complexity? Secondly, the UK Supreme Court, uh, which obviously hears appeals uh, in civil matters um, from, uh, from not just England, but also uh, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, it will no longer be able to issue judgments on planning law of application to the whole of the UK. And I think it's notable that three of the most important and informative planning cases of the last 10 years have been from Scotland, Tesco and Dundee on planning policy interpretation, Walton on SEA and the Aberdeen case on Section 106 and their Scottish equivalent. And in future, the Supreme Court's planning case day will be in country specific silos. And I'm not sure that's going to be very helpful either to the court or to those informed by their judgments. And lastly, what about projects spanning the border? between England and Wales or the border between England and Scotland? How will they be treated in a coordinated fashion by two radically different regimes? I'm sure a way can be found, um, but it needs to be thought about uh, carefully. Thank you all for listening and I look forward to your comments. Well, we have had so many questions already. I'm, I'm beginning to think that we need to gather these together as some sort of uh, consultation response exercise because there's some really good, uh, detailed, thoughtful um, comments and uh, um, perhaps I, 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 I'll move on to, to John to, to address partly one of the, the, the questions, which is, you know, someone who's worked with the Australian system saying, you know, their view is that it can be particularly cumbersome for dealing with complex locations, can take a, an age to change. A, and then there's been some other questions about how, how we deal with, you know, urban, uh, uh, urban development, how we deal with heritage, etc. So. So John, your experience from Hong Kong, um, and I see you're on mute before, uh, yes. Your, your experience is from Hong Kong. Thank you, Simon. Uh, um, can I just say at the outset that I, like um, Bridget, um, would struggle to find anybody, I think, in this country who 
would say that the current planning system is uh, simple, um, transparent, uh, <coughs> and anything other than opaque. But at the same time, I, I would not pin my colours to uh, a zoning system because any system and every system is far from perfect. And so I mean, my experience is particularly of the zoning system in Hong Kong, um, where I've got experience both at planning inquiries, I've written a book there, um, I appear in the High Court all the way up to the Court of Final Appeal there in planning and planning related matters. So I've seen it at, at all levels. <clears throat> um, and for the four minutes I've got, I want to just spend literally a minute on providing an outline of uh, the planning regime in Hong Kong, <coughs> which started in 1939 with the town planning ordinance, and which, and hold your breath, uh, was 14 sections long. I think it's got up to now, with the latest amendments, about 36 sections compared to the Town and Country Planning Act uh, and its 360 odd separate sections and all the subordinate legislation. <coughs> uh, so the, the introduction of, of town planning in Hong Kong in 1939 had the very, very simple aim of promoting health, safety, convenience, uh, and general we welfare of the communi community by making provision for the systematic preparation and approval of plans for the future layout of existing and potential urban areas, as well as for the types of buildings suitable for erection in those areas. And they uh, very much were the first outline uh, zoning plans. There was no regulation outside of the urban areas, uh, <coughs> except as provided by restrictions imposed through the uh, block crown leases. As people may know, in Hong Kong, there is no such concept as freehold land. The only element of freehold land is owned by the church, uh, St. John's Cathedral. Otherwise, all land is owned leasehold, originally from the crown and now from the Hong Kong government. <coughs> Um, and so there is an element of planning restriction and control imposed through restrictive covenants imposed in the leases themselves. Um, in the 1970s, um, planning began to change and there was introduced a requirement for planning permission in very limited circumstances with statutory rights of a review and subsequent appeal uh, and an extension <coughs> of the outline plans um, in the 1990s to cover the whole of Hong Kong. So not simply then the urban areas, but outside uh, of the urban areas into the rural areas as well. Those plans are prepared by the town planning board uh, and these typically make provision for both infrastructure, so roads and railways, etc., but also zone areas for particular uses. And they are broadly defined as residential, commercial, industrial, government, community, country, parks, environmental protection areas, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, and development for a use defined in the outline zoning plan is not then generally subject to further planning control, except for the largest projects. Uh, and planning applications and appeals are few and far between. Now, that is not to say, as Charlie has alluded to, that it is a system free of legal challenge. Um, far from it. Many of the outline <laughs> plans were adopted some years ago and a concern that the increasing height and density, particularly of the urban areas, was having inc increasingly significant environmental effects, particularly in relation to air quality, has resulted in more recent times with the town planning board amending many of those outline zoning plans covering those urban areas to restrict things like the heights of buildings and to introduce no development areas and uh, building setbacks to try and improve natural ventilation. And unsurprisingly, uh, landowners faced with the prospect of those restrictions on the development or redevelopment of their sites have brought a series of judicial reviews challenging the amendments to those plans. Uh, the, second area where, <laughs> the second area has been where landowners have applied to amend the outline zoning plans there's no, as I say, systematic process of review of those plans, and the onus is on landowners to apply to amend the outline zoning plan where, for example, it wishes to build something that does not currently fall within a zoned use. And where those applications which are made to the town planning board 
are rejected, there is no right of appeal, and the only recourse is by way of judicial review to the High Court. Uh, the third area of challenge in Hong Kong has been in relation to the refusal of grants of planning permission. Uh, they are <laughs> relatively rare simply because there are relatively few circumstances in which it's necessary to apply uh, uh, for planning permission. But um, where that is necessary, uh, and it goes uh, on appeal to the Town Planning Appeal Board, and again, uh, much in the same way as in the UK, uh, there is then the opportunity to judicially review uh, that decision up to the High Court. Um, so there is undoubtedly a light touch regime, but the context for that light touch regime, I think, is very important. <laughs> it actually means that for the majority of development in Hong Kong, there is a, a very light planning touch for schemes that comply with the uses specified in the relevant uh, outline zoning plans. And indeed, the iconic skyline of Hong Kong is a product of that light touch. But it's not a system that is free of problems and has to be seen in the context in which it operates, including, as I've referred to already, a land use system where all the land is owned leasehold and the government is able to exert a degree of control through the lease conditions it imposes. It is uh, a small geographical area, does not have the complexity of, of places like the UK or, or uh, uh, continental Europe or, or the US or Australia. Uh, it has a centralized plan making body. Again, it doesn't have the multitude of local authorities with different ideas of what is uh, and what is right and what is wrong. It also, I think importantly, has a culture of renewal. Um, Hong Kong, in terms of its modern history, is you know, barely 100 years old. Uh, and part of its DNA is that if something is no longer fit for purpose, then it, it's taken down and something better and more efficient uh, is, is rebuilt. Um, and, and lastly, it doesn't have the real sense of statutory protection for her heritage assets that um, the UK has again, uh, is a problem that Charlie has referred to. And the last point I wanted to just touch on was environmental protection. Charlie has referred to the fact that there is a separate environmental permitting regime in Hong Kong, which is engaged with after a, a development is consented. And so it is less about whether or not a development should go ahead. And it's much more about what are the environmental implications of this scheme, which is likely, which is going to be going ahead, and how do we mitigate that? And so I use as an example the 34-mile Zhuhai Sea Bridge connecting Hong Kong to Macau, um, <coughs> uh, which was consented uh, and then had to go through an environmental permitting uh, process uh, after the event, and which inevitably led to challenges in the High Court in relation to that environmental uh, permitting exercise. So and I think so really by summary, yes, it's a system which has certainly been efficient, um, but at the expense possibly of impact on environment and heritage assets. Um, and it's certainly not free of, of, of its problems, including the legal challenges, because uh, of <coughs> the, the invested interests in the outline zoning plan and the inability of that plan to change rapidly with yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting uh, example, but I just wonder, you know, how, you know, the importance of cultural and sociological differences between, you know, somewhere like that uh, and some, some, somewhere like Great Britain, uh, and also not just the cultural and sociological differences, but it sounds like that, you know, the structure of land ownership, because something I want to come, come on to um, maybe in the Q&A later is the whole question of the potential for land value capture and whether zoning has a part to play in that. So, well, uh, to, to answer the second question first, uh, I mean, the answer is the government enjoys all the land value capture. So what happens in practice is that um, land is sold, government takes a premium for the sale of that original sale of that land. If that land is then subsequently redeveloped and, and it is developed to within the parameters set down in the, in the lease granted by government, mm -hmm. if uh, that building then is redeveloped, um, the government charges a renewal premium because the lease is now being either modified or renewed. And so it takes another capital of sum all over again. That's how much yeah. of Hong Kong's 
government money is generated. It's through land sales and uh, the redevelopment of land, which it then captures all the value of the uplifts in, 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 and it charges those premiums at market value. So that's answer the first one. The, the point about the sociological and the social and, and cultural aspect is really what I was saying before, that the DNA in Hong Kong is not inherently to preserve it is if something becomes outdated, inefficient, no longer fit for purpose, is that you take it down and you build something that is fit for purpose, uh, more efficient, higher, etc. And that, of course, has then led to some of the problems in the urban areas with the increased density and the retrospective attempts by the town planning board to amend outline zoning plans to then cap uh, building heights, uh, heights and the like. Um, and I say that DNA, I think, is very, very different to the UK, where uh, I mean, we've all been at countless planning inquiries where anything which has the remotest whiff of historic interest is jealously guarded. Uh, and you know, there are lots of examples where that is absolutely right, but equally, there are lots of examples where um, the historic interest is, is absolutely tangential. Yeah, no, thanks, John. So, so, so Steve, be really interested in your personal views on all of, all of this, but, but also uh, and many of the questions have ra raised this really the you know the importance of the local voice and and um you know how 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 local engagement maybe neighborhood planning etc fits in all this but but you know what do you think yeah thanks simon and, and um <coughs> and uh, good evening everybody um given bridget's uh, and then john's comments I, mean, I i feel a bit as though as the only planner on the board i think uh, that i'm i've been invited to a man city convention and i'm the one that's wearing a bobby charlton t-shirt um, the um, uh, I've, got, I've got four points that, that, I'm, that I'm going to make, uh, but before I do, I've got a challenge which I think uh, is worth uh, airing before I make my four points on zoning, and that's about uh, urging the government to reach out and listen to a, a wider views. I mean, to be fair, if you look at our panel tonight, it's uh, five blokes and, and Bridget. Um, I think that the uh, task force or commission, or whatever you're going to call it, the government ha has put uh, forward is predominantly white and male. Um, the white male voice ca calling for planning change who have probably benefited from the planning system that's existed for the last 70 years is a challenge. And I call the, the government to be more diverse in its approach to this uh, agenda, to reach out to people, to make sure that there's an appropriate gender mix on the task force, to ensure that there's an appropriate ethnic mix on it. And finally, let's have somebody under 40 on the board. I mean, it, it's just a, 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 an obvious challenge, which, which I want to make before I make my four points. My four points are these. <coughs> um, zoning is not necessarily the system that gives you the best outcome every time. It, it's not the case that you always get a better outcome for zoning. Uh, you can uh, walk 15 minutes in Rome, Paris and Sydney and find poor outcomes that have been from a system that has been zoned. Um, particularly, I'd say uh, I've seen suburban development in Sydney where it's gridiron and pattern book development which I would not say is great placemaking, uh, particularly when the pattern book uh, tends to lead people to try and pick the biggest house they can possibly get on the plot, minus the size of a swimming pool. I think that um, if there's a problem with the current system, and I, I'll come on to a minute, I, I'm not a blind defender of the current system, but if there is a current problem with the system, it's very often user error, not system error. And I think we need to reflect on, on that. The second point is about uh, picking up on both uh, um, Charlie and, and uh, Bridget's earlier points. Who, who, who does this? Who, who does the zoning? Uh, who decides which area gets zoned? Who decides what, zoning, uh, what is zoned and what the specifications are? It strikes me we still need plans, we still need maps, we still need decision makers. And I think that um, uh, we're in, uh, we could end up with a situation, and I think Bridget did pick up on this, we could end up with a situation which is just different, but not necessarily better. And I think we need, really need to have the debate about whether or not this is really going to be, be better. And that brings me to my third point, which is about the community engagement. And you mentioned neighbourhood plan, Simon. I think it's absolutely uh, important that we remember that. The government issued a letter only today uh, in which it uh, re-emphasises the fact that um, neighbourhood plan remains a, uh, a mainstay of its policy. Neighbourhood planning is important. It's a letter which is calling for authorities to seek funding. 
Um, and I think that um, uh, the, the idea that uh, we have a zoning system, which some people may perceive as a top-down planning system which removes the local voice, is, is a challenge for the thinking. I think that uh, the government started off with neighbourhood planning and the changes with the view that people needed to think that planning was done for them, not to them. And I think that if we remember that, we need to think to ourselves, how does the zoning system still meet that aim? How do we, how do we stop the view that planning is done unto people? And actually, I'm sorry, Bridget, but actually I, I quite like bits of our current system. Uh, I, I, I like the fact that, that you can get planning approval for something that isn't in the plan. Uh, it, because how can I possibly predict everything? And if someone comes forward with the right development, then uh, having the opportunity, the planning system to still approve it, I think is something which is of, of value. And certainly it's something that can be achieved through neighborhood plans and neighborhood development orders. I said it wasn't a blind defense. And my fourth point is to reemphasize it's not a blind defense of the planning system. Uh, I think that there, uh, as Duncan has said, that, that there are things that the current system has uh, that we could do more of. I think that, for example, uh, one of the things that uh, we should look at with uh, our hand on our hearts is how we're resourcing the current system. Uh, if you don't resource a system, you can't expect it to perform. <clears throat> and so if you want more plans, then you should try and ensure that there's enough planners in the system, that there should be enough cheap planners, cheap plan planning should be actually valued within our community, not seen as a system to beat. Um, I think that um, uh, someone said to me recently that uh, you should learn to dance with the devil, uh, not uh, swap it for the deep blue sea. And I think that there's, there's something in that, thinking about how do you make the system work better? And you can put more resources into it. Don't try and beat the system, try and make it work. I do think you can make plan making simpler. I do think you can make the plan and examination system simpler. Plans should not take so long and, and, and the complexity of the examination system is, is there to be talked about. I wrote a paper hmm, eight, nine years ago, which talked about think the unthinkable, should we have a system that has a plan where you need a plan, but has a different system where you don't. Um, one of the problems with the chief planner is that uh, and the chief planner's role in the central government, they often don't think the chief planner knows any, as much about planning as other people do. But that thinking about having a system which is flexible, I would uh, urge uh, the current uh, task force to think further. And finally, Promoting the existing LDOs and NDOs, there are success stories about how the LDOs have been used and you can still have zoning. So, my conclusion. One, be careful what you wish for, because you may just be replacing one thing with another thing. Second, the existing system can be better and should be better. You, thirdly, you can zone now. Fourthly, and completely off script, this, this uh, potentially misses the opportunity to be more radical with the planning system. I believe that if you were to have a more digitized planning system that uh, uh, was more transparent and open, it would meet Bridget's opening uh, a challenge. It would be more efficient, it would be more transparent, it would be more acceptable. So let's not zone, let's make it digital. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Steve. Great, great comments. And we'll pick up on in the... Uh... Q and A in a minute, but I, I want I wanted to get to so Stuart. Stuart, you've been patiently sit, sitting there. Your, your views as as the the, the the developer on the panel, um, you know, uh, uh, thinking a lot about zoning. You know, what do you see as the advantages of uh, of the, you know moving to a system, you know, that is more about um, ag agreeing the parameters up front with the authority in a zoning scheme and, and then a swifter back end of the process, perhaps depoliticized. Well, if I take Steve's point about um, zoning and think, where is it in the present environment? It's a bit confusing. We used to think that each use fitted into a particular category. But today, uh, what was made in the factory can actually be made in the office. So what is the office? Uh, it can be highly computerized, it can have model making, a huge variety. And a hotel can have co-working as well as bedrooms. So what's a hotel? And a home, as we have all just seen, uh, just seeing now, um, is also a, an office mm. and a cafe. Um, or a bar could be an office. So don't we need some flexibility? 
And I view the word zone as a definition of a broader area, a housing district, a business district, rather than this very prescriptive system which we have now. And I often think when we talk about planning, how is it that the parts of the UK that we all love, perhaps the towns like Bath with their terraces and circuses uh, planned by Mr. Wood Senior and Junior, um, they didn't really think of zoning, they thought of communities. And they thought of how could they link fashionable Bath and its spa with appropriate housing to attract people. So we need to be in the present age, and it's a social age with huge amounts of social change. Um, the way we live and work is completely different. But to do all this, we need infrastructure. And in a country which has a habit of undersize, undersizing everything, we undersize our railways, we undersize our roads, our civic facilities. It's kind of a sort of British thing to do. Uh, why do we do it? Why did we build the M1 one with two lanes when we knew that in America they had four lanes? Well, we didn't really have an idea of what its function was apart from going from A to B. We should have surely thought, well, what's gonna happen along this road? Where, which areas will be zoned. Um, and that flexibility is very un-British. Um, I personally, I, um, perhaps to my wife's annoyance, I'm a fan of being tidy. So I like the notion of being planned. But um, any area which is going to be zoned needs the infrastructure to get there. And if we look at the huge transformations that have gone on, um, if you think of in London of King's Cross, um, without the railway kit that's there, there wouldn't have been a huge regeneration opportunity. So infrastructure drives um, social change and I think that flexibility, if you look at a project like King's Cross, it's got a range of uses, um, a lot of office space, a lot of commercial, retail, social, restaurants. Um, it would have been far better, I think, to have been zoned. So as it went along, it could have adapted itself to the, the, the differing needs. Um, so infrastructure, is a prerequisite to any area which is zoned. And I think the meaning of zoning in the context we're talking today is planned. But the word planned, as Bridget said, has become so complex. On one hand, every brick upon brick has to be approved. On the other, if you move a use class from one to the other, it's a requirement. So I'm reminded, um, of the process. Uh, I was involved in a project near Heathrow, Stockley Park, where the buildings were described as high tech. Well, the high tech process changes from uh, design or research of the new project through to um, process expansion. What, do you, what actually is it? How do you make it? Through to marketing, sales, offices. And then you start all over again. But under the present system, each of those changes by themselves would require a different consent. So a simple definition of zoning might be high tech technology, which is the growth area. And the old notion of planning was, well, we don't want dirty industry. Um, we want clean and um, the old smokestack factory at the end of the road must be harmful. Well, look at what the removal uh, of those industries did in the 60s. They took away local employment and they, they provided no real jobs, no real community growth. 
Um, so the inflexibility in this system, the good intentions of new towns, um, actually had really difficult consequences, unintended consequences. But in a zoning system, we must plan infrastructure. Everyone knows, and forgive me, I'm a cab driver really, a Londoner, that um, Crossrail 2 was a good idea. Um, but we couldn't go from Crossrail 1 to Crossrail 2 and plan forward. That's not a very British thing to do. It's organized. So I'm advocating that if we have a zoning system, we will be planning, but we wouldn't know the micromanagement of what was going to happen on Crossrail 2's created new sites. And why, for instance, um, have we not looked at Crossrail 1? It's going to be a terrific piece of kit to commute on, so long as it's not very crowded. Um, but there was no really real zoning in it. The amount of development has been extremely limited uh, because we're paranoid about what would happen on the way. Uh, and yet, as I've said before, we love the natural elements of the 19th and 18th century. We call those beautiful and we like the squares and spaces. So I'm advocating that a zoning system would be much simpler. Um, I'm also thinking about planned communities and how they work. Um, we're in a lot of difficulty with retail in high streets. Again, very prescriptive uses. Um, the flexibility of a town centre, surely, should just be a zone. Um, and I'm not for a moment advocating the lack of quality of design. I'm in love with architecture. I see the benefits of good architecture, making good communities, good homes, good businesses, enhancing our lifestyle. But um, we're not very good at these sort of planned spaces. Um, we really should be responding um, to the needs of Steve Corton they said, of changing communities. I feel very conscious, Steve, of the need to look after everyone. But the reality of our system is that people forget forgotten. They're just left behind. I, I don't think anybody does this on purpose, but um, we are in a system which, because of its inflexibility, doesn't allow people who are of more modest means to be housed in decent, decent houses and decent flats with more space because everything is so restricted in terms of height, in terms of use. So I'm advocating that um, zoning would be more flexible. On the other hand, would respect any of the rules that we have. Um, I think that many parts of our system are extremely productive in, in that planned community that I spoke to. But we should respect those areas. We should respect listed buildings. But that doesn't mean that uh, we can't build modern next to them. I always think of the past of um, Mr. when Mr. Wren arrived at Hampton Court and built something which was pretty high tech against the Tudor Palace, um, that wouldn't have got permission today. Um, for using all the benefits of a planned system to allow for growth, for public space, planned in a human way. That's really clear, Stuart. Thank you. Um, could I just ask one, one follow-up question? I'm really pleased from the perspective of my role as chair, that I've allowed everyone to have their say within the hour. Um, we will go on because there, there are so many issues we still need to pin down. We won't do them all, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, first of all, 
you talked about standards, um, Stuart, um, you know, possibly national standards, maybe standards set by local authorities in terms of, for example, room sizes in dwellings. Um, you know, how do you see the balance between you know, what things should be for to be set at a national level and what at a more local level? Do you feel that we're reinventing the wheel with every authority? Or? Well, there should be some national standards. We used to have Parker Morris. Parker Morris was decent. And now we've got the idea that because of prohibitive land costs, we've got to build micro units. The social consequences of some of today's activities because of land values need to be thought about. So yes to national standards, but yes to local vernacular. Yeah. Uh, yes to kite marking of some of the detail. A current planning uh, document might be 200 pages. Surely there could be some national standards about environmental issues, um, flood risk and all that paraphernalia of the planning system. Couldn't it be written down? Could it be clear that uh, going back again to Steve, you had to get a sign off from an independent organization, perhaps the BRE, and once you signed off, you put that sign off into an electronic uh, planning system. Um, I often think of a story somebody told me that there's more technology in, an, in a Nintendo game than there is the whole of the planning system. There must be ways of making it easier at the same time, more defined, faster, quicker, and uh, this may, say, str may seem strange as a developer, less expensive. I worry about the costs. You know, the city of London has got a planning system which has been extremely flexible. So the cost of an o o office 40 years ago and today is the same. People can't believe that, it's correct. Why couldn't we have had that where people were absolutely aware of social needs so that housing costs actually came down rather than went up? Zoning could do that. That's going to take me on to a question I was going to ask either, uh, either Bridget or, or, or Duncan, maybe Bridget first, which is about, you know, the opportunity for land value capture or, you know, how do you see the, the, the economics of the development process uh, in terms of whether a, a move towards zoning might assist in any way? Uh, I think those are very different questions actually. They're independent of one another. You can think about how you do land value capture differently in our current system or you could think about how it would relate to say a more standardised approach. I'm sure we can all debate for ages the operation of SIL uh, and indeed section 106s and we thought we were going to replace section 106 by something simpler called SIL and guess what we got both. <laughs> so I, I absolutely agree with everybody who says be careful what you wish for. I'm really clear that there are huge risks in anything you change but equally I think that in terms of you know, land value capture actually quite often gets absorbed the land value and some of the numbers that some people have, have been showing me shows how all the land value gets captured by the costs of doing the planning process in the first place. And I think that one of the reasons why it's really difficult for people to concentrate on quality, on public realm, on local engagement, is that the kinds of engagement that they are able to do and the way that the whole variety of local development plans or site allocation or special master plans, etc., etc., become so overwhelming that the system itself takes over. I actually disagree with Steve, who said no, the problem is not the system, it's user error. Any system which has as much user error as this one, I think it's got, there, there's some system stuff in there as well. So I'm still passionate that we need to think about this. I'm aware that there are risks, and I'm not certainly not um, blasé about saying zoning is a, a zoning system like Australia is the answer but I'm very much with Stuart around how you think about that infrastructure piece, the broader picture, so that you can then generate a bit more value for anybody, including yeah. the provision of the infrastructure actually to capture it. But what I don't want to see is something where you just say, well, let's have more taxation 
and all of that never gets recycled back into the planning process. Simon, so forgive, forgive, mm. Simon, forgive me, would HS2 cost 100 billion if there was land value recapture on the way and the Far Eastern model had been adopted that development pays for infrastructure? Uh, and the problem there is that you get such narrow windows that you're allowed to have both with Crossrail. I, I wanted with Crossrail one when I was looking at that, I wanted to have a um, an, a, a, a committee, an organisation which would check that the development around the stations was actually happening and put pressure on boroughs and so on to put to bring forward development and have plans which would allow for that and master plans around stations and so on. But I oh know that yeah, it's a transport scheme. You're not allowed to do that. So, Stuart, you're right because in Hong Kong, uh, whenever the MTR is expanded, I mean, a lot of the money that it spends yeah. on the infrastructure that it's building is recouped through the development of overstation developments. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways I worked out some calculations for how that would work for Crossrail, but it yeah wasn't wasn't part of the rules of the game. So, so Duncan, any comments on that? And then I wondered. You know, uh, there are a number of questions about climate change and dealing with biodiversity and the other challenges that we face. And actually, we haven't even touched on beauty. Um, I wonder whether, you know, you and then maybe Ch Charlie could, could say something about, well, you, you on that land value capture, if you've got anything to add, but, but on climate, climate change. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd say on land value capture is I think, you know, the advantages of a zoning system are perhaps also that, you know, it, a zoning system would, in a way, fix base land values a bit well earlier in the process and more transparently. The concept of land value capture is perhaps easier for landowners to accept as well if, if the consequences of zoning are more immediate and give them, you know, give value. Um, so I, I do think it has some some attraction there. And going back to the earlier point about digitalizing the system, in some ways zoning lends itself well to that, and could also lend itself well to you know discussions around value capture, tariffs, and payments that should be made towards infrastructure. Um, I think on your other points, I think there's there's certainly scope in uh, you know in any zoning system where you have a policy that sits alongside it, plus you know in individual areas. It's not just necessarily as simple as saying it's zoned for those uses and for that form of development. There are also tools that, that exist, such as what I think what are called overlays in um, Australia um, or specific provisions which can address issues such as biodiversity and climate change. But I think it does take us back to the earlier point that Steve made about user error, because I think I do think we we don't ask often enough what our system would be like if it was well resourced and and you have to also ask what a zoning system would be like if it is not well resourced and one of the comments made in the QA, q and a which i think is right is if the zoning system isn't well resourced and regularly revisited and reviewed it can lock in inequalities and it can lock in ironically housing shortages for example if it identifies an area for low density housing and all the developable plots are used up then unless the zoning is changed, you're left with low density housing and no opportunity to increase density and provide homes that people might be desperate for. So, yeah. Charlie, climate change briefly. Uh, climate change, I mean, I think in, in principle, actually, that it would be relatively um, achievable to work in meaningful requirements on climate change and indeed biodiversity to a zoning system. Um, I mean, if we take as a basic model of zoning that you have less discretion and, and a more certainty of parameters at the plan making stage, then, then there's a greater ability to apply some stick on climate change at the central level. And in relation to biodiversity, the habitats directive is already quite rigid. I mean, how many cases have we done where Europe have been successfully relied upon on a discretionary basis to get to get away with an impact on habitats, very few. So um, in a sense, there's not a huge greater degree of rigidity under a zoning system than there is under the plan making process. And again, with net gain, there might be even greater stick, uh, even greater ability to, 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 to achieve something really meaningful across the board um, than under the Environment Bill. So uh, I think they're actually possibly less difficult issues than the, than the sort of need for a detailed project specific heritage and environmental assessment, um, actually. And I'm going to ask a, a final question to um, 
uh, to, to, to Steve, which, which, um, uh, which is, is, is really about um, the building better, building beautiful, you know, commission recommendations on beauty, which Robert Jenrick seemed to, you know, take on board and be looking for a way to bring forward. I mean, is, is that a complete, on a completely different track, do you think, to these, to these discussions or can these be knitted together? That's, that's what one question. The, the other question was about transition to a new system, which is something, you know, you, you have, you know, in your time at MHCLG, you saw, you know, so many significant changes to the system. I mean, it, it, are, are the changes, that, the, the problems that come about through, you know, the actual process of transitioning to an, an, a different system, um, a, a reason not to make changes or something to be weighed in the balance? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a lot in there, Simon. I mean, uh, yeah, obviously there's a, an issue about uh, any change can bring a chilling effect to, to the development mm -hmm. industry. And, and if people think there's going to be a new system, why would I prepare a local plan with uh, housing figures in it, which politically might be unacceptable? Why wouldn't you just say, well, hang on a bit, <coughs> I'll, I'll wait for three years for the zoning system, and then I'll zone this area is no development. Now, of course, um, as has been said by other panelists, national policy and, and, and uh, sort of setting out targets that can still, can still apply. I want to pick up just three quick things though. <coughs> I, I'm sure the recording will, will prove me right, but I, I did say it's often user error. <coughs> I wasn't blaming all users, as there was often user error. And I stand by that because it's a bit like uh, since my retirement, I bought a new computer. Uh, I can't blame the computer, the fact that I'm struggling to work out how the new system works. I'm not used to it. I have to get used to it. I have to learn the, the, uh, the way this computer works. Once I've learned it, I'll be able to use it. So there is a bit about, you know, be careful if you just blame the system and think about how it's used. I do think the Building Better, Building Beautiful brings with it certain challenges. For example, one of the recommendations is that provably popular designs and architecture should be uh, supported, which is great if you're from a bottom-up point of planning, but um, probably more difficult to say, well, how are you going to zone for something that is uh, you know, not necessarily the same in Carlisle as it is in Truro? Now, my final point is that none of this is necessarily a reason not to do any of this stuff. <coughs> uh, the, 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 I think the, uh, the thing that I'd like to leave people with is keep an open mind. Let's not go into this debate prejudiced in a particular view, which is why I, I was hesitating before being seen to be a blind defender of the existing system. I'm not. There are things with the existing system that can be better. But if you're going to go into a review, think about what you want the planning system to achieve, and then think about how to achieve that. And it isn't necessarily of jumping from one system to another. There are some things you'd want to keep and some things you'd want to change. And that may include some toning. And that's all I'm saying. But Simon, could I make a quick comment on beauty? Very quick. We must finish in two minutes. So, yeah. If we had a free market, competitive market, more supply, people would have to compete against each other. And at present, there's no real competition. Thank you. Well, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Thanks for those who stayed with it to the end. Uh, I hope you agree there's a lot to think about. Um, really interesting ideas about how we might see the planning system evolve. Um, and I, at some pace, I would suspect, um, my take is that um, there definitely is merit in moving much of the role of the planning system more towards the plan making zone defining stage. And there are some practical ways that this can be achieved, but certainly not one size fits all. Um, I, I'm sorry that we didn't manage to answer all of your questions, but as I said, we will review them after the event and the, the comments are really, are really interesting and we'll come back where we can with a short written response. So finally, thank you so much everyone uh, for tuning in and thank you most of all to our panel. Um, that was fantastic. Thanks very much and good night.